Hell is it? Hell you. Um, today's session is going to be relatively short, hopefully, <laughs> because uh, myself and Mary have got a fair bit planned before we're going away Monday, and um, and I'm trying to get the website modified before Monday as well. And I've got about 20 hours programming to do in the next day and a bit still. So. Um, so what we're going to do is a very concise presentation today <laughs> regarding God's way of love and the things that are happening in God's way of love organisation. That's the primary. This is, this, so this talk is God's way of love and the different projects and we're, uh, that are going on in God's way of love. And we're going to add two new teams. There's two new teams that we want to talk to you a little bit about. Um, we're not going to talk to you a lot about them, just a little bit about the teams. And we hope that uh, over the next few months, some of you who want, might want to be involved in those teams will get to know those teams better. Uh, we also want to outline some projects that we've got happening in the God's Way of Love organisation as well, just so that you know about them. And also we want to outline the different resources that we need. And a lot of the resources don't really have much to do with money, but, uh, but money obviously would would assist us in some ways. So, so we'll talk about some of the resources that we need to get some of the projects that we're looking to do underway. So that's the primary purpose of the talk today. The first team I would like to introduce you to is a, a new team called the Community Team. Um, the leader of the Community Team at the moment uh, has just been sort of appointed and that's Karen, where are you? Would you like to stand up? So, so that's Karen there. So it's Karen Pronk. At the moment, we have no assistant to the team. So uh, that, that's going to come along as, as the team unfolds. The email address for the team is just community at God's Way of Love. Dot org. So if you would like to become a member of that team, that's the address you will email to. Now, I suppose the first question is, well, what does the team do? Well, we'd like to... We see the community team as being one of those teams that actually has an effect on society in lots and lots of different areas. So if you look at all of the different things in, in the community we live at large, um, you can see that we could break down the community into different areas. So um, the community team will be involved in all of the different areas of, of trying to um, provide... Well, basically, the, the underlying core reason for creating the team is to give gifts to the community. Does that make sense? Now, obviously, for most of us, uh, we might not have much uh, money available to give gifts to the community. So obviously, that's going to involve mostly our time, giving the gift of our time to the community in some way. So, so for example, there are many different things that are occurring in the community where more time is needed in order for things to occur in a, in a better way. And, and the community needs time given to it, generally, in terms of... Uh, well, I can, I can think of literally hundreds and we'll go through them in a minute uh, with your assistance. But one of the things we want to focus on in the team, though, is to focus on the cause of a problem, not, not the effects. So in other words, we don't see much point in giving our time to the community when all we're doing is band-aiding what's already going on that's already not very good. Does that make sense? We see that there's a need to give to, to have a focus on the cause of the different issues. Now, if I can just give you a very basic principle with, or an understanding of that. Let's say throughout the community we often see litter in public places, right? Now, 
there's a way we, we need to fix up the effect. In other words, we need to be able to provide time to the community so that we can pick up that litter and dispose of that litter in some way so that it doesn't make a mess to the community. So, so we'd want to do that, but that is the effect, isn't it? What's the cause? Any ideas? Can we put up hands and microphones? So... A lack of self-love, a lack of respect for community property. Okay, so how would you address that problem? What would you do to address that problem? It's not, no good going and lecturing the community about how they should pick up their papers and so forth. And it's no good fining them because that's what already happens a lot of the times. Uh, not that I've seen it happen much in terms of real life, but there is often a littering fine and yet that doesn't stop people from uh, littering their community. So obviously those two issues can't be addressed in the way that mankind's currently addressing them. So what would you do if you were also focused on the cause of littering? What, what do you think you would do? Any ideas? Angela, you would like to... It's just um, I was just thinking something like perhaps a... Um a letter to the newspaper, you know, just um, giving our sort of take on it, you know, or I mean, no. well, that, that'll just come across as being preachy, wouldn't it? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, what, uh, what, what could we else could we do, Ke Kelly? Let's just if you leave your hand up. Can you see finding? Finding solutions to the cause is a lot harder <laughs> to finding the solution to the effect, and that's why most people don't do it. Right? Be the example ourselves. So number one, being an example ourselves as to what you do with your own litter. Yes? Yep. Yes? Next? Our own attitude, you know, our own um, self-loving, our own humility. Yep, I agree. Yep. That will fix you, but it won't necessarily fix... The community. So what would you do? Barbara? Um, public information nights or children uh, workshops um, through schools, education systems. Okay, so a lot of it is going to be educational, isn't it? Can you see that? And if you focus on educational that's voluntary and also that focuses on young people as well yeah so that it would be putting together some kind of program that that is voluntary but that that is interesting and fun so this is where we need to start to be creative in terms of solving the actual problem Christiana this mic's behind I feel it's got something to do with showing the end result of by putting a um, piece of paper there um, where does it go? What happens to it and everything? And um, there was once I saw a documentary about following a thong in Africa. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was just left on the thing. And its whole journey, they followed that thong all the way through all the waterways and various things and ended up out into the ocean. And, yeah. of course, we have a, a huge pile of rubbish here out in the, um, the ocean, the state of Texas, just off um, um, the states, I think it is. Yeah. And just showing, you know, what actually happens to that piece of piece of rubbish exactly yeah so even a little like a video documentary even tracing a piece of rubbish would be an interesting little educational tool these are and you could make them funny and uh, as well couldn't you and 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 educate through the process so so can you see that the community team if it's going to focus on the cause is going to need to be quite clever with the way that it addresses problems we don't want to be preachy we don't want to force people to do things they don't want to do. We want to encourage people to do the loving thing through, firstly, our actions, but also, secondly, through addressing the causes of issues rather than the effects. But that doesn't mean we would not sometimes look at the effect because, for instance, if, if litter is on the, in, in a public place, it's there and it needs to be cleaned up by somebody. So, so we need to address the issue, but we also need to address the cause of the issue Without, without doing it in an unloving manner. So we need to do, address the cause in a, lo in a loving manner. So AJ, does that mean that the, one of the 
projects that the team will work on is actually developing those educational programs in harmony with love and truth. Yes. A as well as perhaps delivering them to the community and demonstrating within the community as well. Yes. Eventually oh. that'll be the case. Yep. yep. Of course, with all of the teams, as you know, a slow start with all of the teams, there's, a, there's a, a number of things that I'd like to address with all the teams, and that is what we're trying to do first is get you used to authority. Many of you are very unwieldy when it comes to uh, respect of authority, and, and this is a problem. You know, obviously in the community, this is going to be a team that has an interaction with the community. If you're not loving towards the community, can you see that straight away you're not practicing the, the truths of the, that, that we're trying to practice? So what we want to do is make sure that the focus is on expressing love towards the community. Now, to do that, we've got to sort ourselves out with love first. Can you see that? So, so what, we're, what we're trying to do now with each of the team leaders is we're trying to mentor the teams in such a way that the team leaders start addressing the issues, the unloving behaviour that occurs within their team. So many of you are already starting to get triggered with that. Many of you are already starting to feel like what's going on with these teams it feels like i'm every time i go that something's happening to me and the reason why is we've we've given the team leaders strict instructions to to begin confronting any unloving behavior in their team in other words in god's way of love organization we are not going to put up with unloving behavior in teams and so so what we've got to do first in all of the organization is to sort out the teams sort out the unloving behaviour and the addictions that are going on inside of the teams, the fear-based attitudes that are in the team. Any anger that's in the team needs to be eradicated from the team. So, so some of the first, the very first uh, programs that I've suggested for Karen to have a, have a go at is all about trying to sort out some of the issues like that within the team. Does that make sense? So every time we start a new team, whatever the new team is, we will be focusing our attention on trying to correct, firstly, the attitudes of the team members. So that will be our first priority. Once we feel the team members are in an attitude of love towards each other, now we believe that they're capable of being in an attitude of love towards other people. Does that make sense to everyone? So, so we need to firstly sort out the attitude of love that exists within the team. And then once the attitude of love within the team has been sorted out and we've got a group of people inside of each team that is cooperating with each other and being loving towards each other and loving towards the spirits that are around us as well, once we've got that happening, then we can let the team loose on, on bigger projects. But we don't see much point in letting a team who's very unwieldy and unloving and not very honest and truthful loose on the world when already them being loose on each other is causing problems. Do, do you understand that? Yep. So what we're trying to do with every team is address the issue, the unloving behaviour that occurs in every team. Now that sometimes means that certain members who are being angry at the time will just be asked to be let leave. It's not up to the team leaders to, tell the te to, to educate the team members as to why they're angry. It's up to each of us individually to work that out. Why was I angry in that situation? And it's up to each of us individually to sort the issue out in the long run as well as to why we engage in certain behaviour in the teams. The team leaders, all they need to do is say, you're angry, you can't stay. That's all they have to do. And please leave if you're angry. And if you're projecting fear at the team, then, it, then you might be given an opportunity to... Uh, to work your way through that, but after, if it's a regular thing, then we just say, please leave until you've sorted out your fear, because we want this team to be in a loving space with each other. And that means no fear, only love, no, no lies, only truth, and everyone then cooperating together, will, everyone cooperating together for a common good. Does that make sense? So our focus inside of the teams, in every team that will be, is to firstly 
work through the disharmony that's occurring in the team. Now, at, at the moment, there's still teams that are, are in a lot of disharmony, and we feel quite strongly that many of the members of that team, uh, we wouldn't want to let loose on the world while they are causing so many problems in the team. Right? And, for example, the mediumship team is a team that uh, is having that problem. The arts team has been having that problem where addictions are pretty big, and those particular teams are you know, being sorted out. Myself and, and Kate and myself, who's the leader of the arts team, and myself and Jane meet together and work out a little program to sort out the team. And what's happening for many of you is many of you are not coming to the team anymore once it starts getting sorted out, and that's great. <laughs> I'm okay with that. I'm okay. I've said to the team leaders, I'm okay with every team having two members, the team leader and the assistant, <laughs> if that's all, it, you know, all it's going to be. But, but at least it needs to be in love. Does that make sense? Once the team is in love, like in the state of love, with each other, now it has the capacity to shine that love to the rest of the community. Does that, that make sense to you, doesn't it? That's the capacity that's present. So, if our focus in every team is expressing love towards the community, particularly if we're involved in serving the community in one of the teams, then we won't have a selfish focus in the team. Now, now, many people have come along to the teams thinking the team would have a selfish focus. In other words, with the arts team, I love drawing, so the, the team's going to help me draw. That's not the way it's going to work, right? Well, we're going to help you engage the passion, but it's going to have to be passion engaged in an attitude of service, not just for taking for yourself. So that's the underlying purpose. And so for many of you, you've noticed that uh, many of the teams have begun to focus again on the constitution of the organisation and the principles that are contained in it to, to try to help you get over these barriers that we have towards loving and using, uh, and using the teams in an unloving manner. So does everyone understand the community team and its general overview? Now, of course, I've been very, very uh, large in that scope. So we're talking that every single time a community team is set up in a certain region, that their focus would be giving, expressing the love of the team towards the community. Not, it won't be a focus of preaching to the community. Does that make sense? Because preaching doesn't work, generally. We need to engage processes where we demonstrate love and demonstrate how practical it can be as well. So the community team is going to be focused on that. Eventually, the community team will have a very large scope because if you look at the different areas of the community, you've got politics, you've got religion, you've got social, social uh, networks and so forth that need to be addressed. You've got things like unemployment, and other problems in the community, you've got crime and, you know, children needing assistance and there's all sorts of things. There's uh, old age people who are living in nursing homes that never get visited. There's all sorts of things in a community where we could bring more love to a community as a, as a team of people. So in the end, it's going to have a very, very wide scope. And, uh, and Karen, who's the leader of the team, you know, has come from a, me from a, a medical background, a healthcare professional background. So Karen sort of understands the needs of a community in terms of healthcare and everything, but it will also be these other areas that will eventually be affected by our involvement somehow. And it doesn't mean that we will necessarily make a religion or make a new poli political party or any of those kind of things. What it is is trying to get what is there currently, giving, giving them the gift of our love but only when it's mostly focused on the cause. Because we, we don't want to spend our time, and I would say in a lot of times waste our time, doing an effect thing over and over and over and over and over again. So in other words, I don't want to see in any of the teams something where every month we go and fix something, and then the next month we have to fix the same thing, and then the next month we have to fix the same thing, because we're only dealing with the effect. So for example, 
if we notice there's a local community area that needs picking up papers and litter and rubbish to be taken away from it, and then a month later that same area's got the same amount of rubbish again, then we don't want to do it twice. We want to look at why it's happening and address why it's happening. And sometimes why it's happening is just simple, like there's nowhere to put anybody's rubbish. <laughs> sometimes the reason why is quite a simple reason. Is there any questions about the community team? If you would like to be a member of the team or be involved in it, then please email Karen on that address and, uh, and Karen will start to uh, educate you about, firstly, the Constitution and, uh, and in, as a team, but also uh, there are different little projects that we've already discussed that Karen's going to start engaging. And what we've decided to do is only engage projects initially that can be completed within one week or less time. So that way you can do a project, complete it, and then measure how it all went. And then address the issues of how it all went, and then do another project, complete it, and see how, that, see how any changes that were uh, put on the team, how that reflected in that new project. Once the team is in a nice, cohesive, loving space, and has an ability to take on longer term projects, and this applies to all teams, then we'd like to see you put, take on bigger projects. So, for example, in the arts team, um, initially there were some ideas of creating a movie. Well, that's a great idea, but there's a lot of things to learn in creating a movie. And you'd be better off creating a five-minute video first and seeing what it, all, what it is that you need to learn. It's, uh, when we started do, doing the communications team, the communications team wanted to do this, this sort of uh, process with the hospitality team. And it worked out that the first time they did it was like four or five hours long and everyone was exhausted by the end. So, so what we suggested was no, make it one hour long where everybody just comes together for one hour and learns something and does something and is nice and concise. Just, so the team leaders will be making projects initially that are short, that don't take a long period of time generally and those particular teams then can en engage this process of change and once they've got to the stage where they can feel comfortable expressing love towards each other and they don't have any aggravation occurring in the team, there's just only love being expressed towards each other in the team, then we can let the team loose on the community. Does that make sense? Okay. Is there any, no questions? Any more questions about that at all? That's great, I'm going to get through this talk very rapidly today. <laughs> okay. The second team that I'd like to introduce you to, um, that you may not know about already exists, is the Soul Team. This is another one of those teams that has a very, very wide scope. The scope that I've given to the team, basically, is to investigate the relationship between soul condition and anything Everything that happens. That's a pretty big scope, isn't it? The, uh, the, team, uh, the team's address, email address, is soul at God's way of love dot org. The team leader at the moment is Zenko. Could you stand up, Zenko, so everyone can see you? That's Zenko. He's the team leader. And the team assistant at the moment is Luli, I think, is this, isn't it? Can you stand up, please, Luli? Luli doesn't like standing up. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got your team leader is Zenko. How do you spell your last name again, Zenko? V-U-K. E-L-I-C, -E that's right. And... and Luli Faber. 
Now, um, you can see that that scope for that team very, very wide. They've already started a lot of investigation. And one of the things that has been really good uh, that Luli has brought to the team is a, is a scientific approach. If I can spell scientific. When I say a scientific approach, I didn't sign scientific approach. Ific. Sorry. You've you brought that the, 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 the tick approach as well. Yeah. Good. So this, the beauty of having a scientific approach is eventually what we'd like to be able to do is collect enough data that will prove the principles of the relationship between soul development and what's happening around the soul. Does that make sense? And to actually present enough data so that eventually medical profession and other professions that are currently on the earth start investigating the data because of the amount of data that's available you know, that, that illustrates the truth of it. So, so this is why it's very important to have a bit of a scientific approach to the team. So anybody who is willing also to engage in another part of this team, which is, um, what would you call it? It's probably called uh, self-experimentation. <laughs> the approach that we feel is that if you're unwilling to experiment on yourself, then you should certainly never experiment on anything else. So in other words, uh, we can't agree with uh, using some kind of lab experiments on an animal where you dissect an animal because you've got to ask the question, would you be willing to do that on yourself? Probably not. And so therefore, we don't want to do it on an animal or anything else. We only want to engage experiments and there are a whole lot of experiments that we can engage in the soul team that, and engage experiments that actually are non-destructive in their nature. Yep. So, so that's the kind of thing the soul team would be doing. Now, um, again, they've already got projects underway. And there's already quite a number of members of the team. There's already projects underway and there's already a lot of data being collected. And at some point we will need to have somebody putting the data together in some, uh, in some way as well. So we want to create the experiments, place the put the data together and have the data presented in the end as papers that we can put on our website that uh, then can produce, that provide scientific evidence about a certain relationship between something that's occurring in the soul and something that's occurring external to the soul. So it should be a, a very, very interesting team. Is there any questions about that team? No, you're all stunned into silence, are you? <laughs> Mary, you would like to ask a question? I just wondered if Zenko and Luli would... I don't know if it's appropriate, but... Um, in book group, Luli shared some of the preliminary findings that the Soul team has already had, and they're quite exciting, and mm -hmm. I wondered if Zenko or Luli would... Doing well, I haven't prepped them for doing so, but no. maybe at some point. What, what I would like to do with the God's Way of Love organisation is have probably a once a month meeting, just a short meeting like today's will be, where, where the different teams can give a, like a 10 minute summary of what the teams have been doing and give you an idea of what's happening in that particular team. And that way everybody is kept up to date with what's going on. AJ, um, <coughs> I'm a member of the SOUL team and I just wondered if it might uh, be okay to just share something that I uh, get out of it. Sure. Because um, initially I thought, oh wow, that's so beautiful, a SOUL team. And then when yes. I heard that it was about um, recording data and experiments, I was quite put off. But yep. I, I went yep. and I'm really glad that I did yep. because... Um, I'm getting a lot out of it just for my own personal, I, I guess, that process um, of recording. I'm not very good at recording, but the bit that I have done um, of recording um, has helped me to stay focused yeah. um, on my relationship with God 
yep. and my processing. Um, so it's been a way of just keeping that focus and really developing and deepening in that. Yeah, yeah. 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 I feel the team has a lot of benefits personally when you're a member of it, but also it's going to have a lot of benefits to the community in the long run because I feel it will provide also the background data for the general community to go and investigate things further. Because at the moment, there is not a large amount of impetus from the general community to investigate the relationships between the soul and its emotional condition and what's happening around it. But, but you imagine in the long run that if the person had a certain type of accident, we always knew what emotion had caused it. You imagine if we had that relationship established through a series of, of data being, being produced through experiments, then we could start to iron out one by one many of uh, the illnesses that, or, or the diseases that are present in today's society just by seeing the relationship between the disease and certain types of emotions. And eventually, hopefully, members of the team would be so educated in certain areas of those particular emotions that if somebody comes along and they say, oh, I've got this disease, the team knows straight away what they need to do to help that particular person. Um, and, what, uh, and there's evidence, uh, scientific evidence, of what a doctor would need to do to help that particular person. So rather than just you know, trying to cure the effect of the disease, we're, we're actually addressing the cause of it, which is our primary, the primary concern. So I feel that team is uh, potentially a very, very interesting team. Like all teams, they have to start with the basics first, you know, getting things right at the beginning. And also, they have to, it has to sort itself out in terms of the amount of love that's in the team itself. So that, that is something that has to happen with every team. Is there any other questions about it at all? Very interesting team. Okay. So rub that out. The third team that you may not know has been uh, established is the development team. And the email address is just development at godswayoflove.org. Um, where is the man? There he is. Justin, you want to stand up? So the leader of the team is Justin Crick. That's how you spell it, isn't it, Justin, the last name? Just simple. And... Uh, at the moment, we have no assistant assigned at this point. Now, many people have been interested in the development team from the point of view because this team will be looking at things like developing clean energy, for example, um, along with many other things. But many people who have been attracted to the team initially were firstly only attracted because of the personal benefits it might give them. But so what we've tried to do here again is we've asked Justin to focus on giving love to the world through the developments. We want to give the gift of any development thing that is actually developed, that actually works, <laughs> and to the world. We don't want to have it uh, um, patented in any way so that just one person can control it, but rather we want to give the gift of it to, to the entire world. Which means once we know how to do a certain thing, we would like to put the knowledge in, a, in the public domain, uh, probably on the net, so, and, and actually send it to lots of people who are already interested in developing that particular thing. So we just send, send all the information out there. Now, uh, in that team, sometimes uh, I've visited the team and taught the team a little bit about electronics as well. It's going to need to know about electronics and electrical systems. Basically, it's going to be involved in things like engineering in the long run. So there are going to be people who need to learn how to weld and how to do lots of other things that are practical things like that with materials. We're going to eventually, and one of the discussions I've had recently which with Justin that we'll put on the net, 
is a discussion I had with him about using living organisms rather than... So, so the trouble with a lot of today's engineering is that it focuses on grabbing dead things and producing more dead things, generally. Um, but as I've described in this discussion I had with Justin, the entire system that God's created is all about chewing up dead things to make live things. Do you know what I mean by that? You look at a forest, anything that's dead in a forest gets degraded into matter that can be used by the living organisms. Everything. And all of the living organisms are programmed to get rid of the dead things. So you look at like things like white ants, ants, they're all, all there to get rid of whatever is dead. Maggots, there to get rid of, rid of whatever is dead and to turn it into support for life. And uh, unfortunately, what man does is we produce dead things like a house, which is made of a lot of dead materials, and then wonder why it degrades in its condition over time. And of course, it has to degrade in condition over time because the entire system God created is all about eating those dead things and chewing them up and turning them back into something that can be used for live things. So um, this is a focus. So we'll be focused on live systems. The systems that have the most intelligence are alive. All of them are alive. And we need to work out how they work. We're not talking about genetic engineering here. We're talking about using the systems that God's already created and understanding how they work and putting them into a process that then can aid the human to survive. So, for example, photosynthesis is a very interesting process, isn't it? Where where a tree gathers all of the resources from the air and from the soil and produces leaves, but, but in the process of producing it, during the day it produces oxygen, at night it, it chews up carbon dioxide, right? And it's got, it's, it's got multiple roles and it's a living organism. And, uh, and we've got to understand it, because if we could understand that, we could understand the effects that that has and we could also understand how to use it ourselves as the same kind of system. So you imagine if uh, you walked into a house and it's an alive house and it automatically is heated to a certain temperature not because you've got any heating but because the live systems have made the inside of that house different in temperature to the outside. Right? And this happens all the time with an ant nest, for example. Right? Particularly in the northern in the north of Australia, we see these big termite mounds with big air conditioning systems, uh, all running a certain way, all, all generating enough power to heat the entire nest. And so you've got live systems that we need to replicate. We need to learn what they are and we need to replicate them. And uh, if you look at anything that man has created that has lasted a long time, it always is a replication generally of something that's already happening in the live systems of the earth. So when we learnt about flight, it was a replication of a bird flying. When we learnt about disease control, it was a replication of what happens inside of our body with disease control. All of these types of scientific things are all replications of what's already happening in the live systems. So the development team is going to be focus some of its attention on the live systems and starting to understand it. As again, you can see it's a very big scope and initially it's going to have to start with very basics. But also it's going to have to start with understanding some things and, and one of the things that uh, we've found most of the people in the team need some help with is maths. Do you find you need help with maths? <laughs> yeah. Most people in the team have need some help with mathematics and so we're actually thinking in the team of having some kind of program that uh, like a s little school once a week or something like that where people could come along and learn, relearn mathematics but from the point of view of its practical application in real life situations. Does that make sense? So they are the kind of things the team is looking at along with environmental development. So in other words, how to plan out a system so that everything works. Um, environmentally so it's quite a large team again with a with a large scope Are there any questions you'd like to ask about that team Morning. 
I've got a bit of a problem where I really like certain things in that team, but then other things I go like, I really don't like it. Uh, many of you are finding that with every team. And uh, this is one of the things we're trying to iron out in the teams initially, is to, we want to get you away from a selfish focus in a team and also anything that you do not like, there is generally a lot of emotion associated with. Right? And the reason why we are creating some uh, exercises in the team that most of the team members don't like is so that you can begin to address the emotions that are present whenever something comes up that you don't like. Now, a lot of the times when things come up that we don't, uh, when, when things come up that we don't like, uh, we react in a way that is quite unloving in many cases, right? Usually there are a few primary emotions we project. Firstly, anger or frustration is an emotion that we have usually project to the team leader or the team. Why are they doing this? Why can't they do it that way? And so forth. Now, anger, remember, always covers the fact that you have an addiction of come some kind. So what we're trying to do in the teams is notice when people are angry and say, well, there's obviously an addiction here inside of you. You don't want to look at the big picture. You see, God's a God that knows the entire picture. Right from the smallest particle, right the way to the, the universe itself, God understands the operation of everything. And once you become more and more like God, you will also have that same desire, the same desire to investigate everything. The same desire to understand everything, not just, not just little areas where you believe you have expertise, but every, everything. Now usually, though, we have areas where we have expertise or we, like, we get certain feelings met. And the, the problem with that, if we don't address it, is we could create a heap of teams that just feed your addictions, but that's firstly out of harmony with the constitution that we created, but secondly, it's also out of harmony with you ever becoming at one with God. So what we're trying to do with the teams is create teams that do trigger your anger, right? that do trigger your addictions, that we can identify the addictions inside of the team members. And please remember, the addictions cover the fears. And usually, whenever there's something we don't like very much at all inside, happening inside of a team, a lot of the time it's because of something in those areas there that we don't want to face. Emotionally face. So we would, we would ask, see initially, initially when we began these teams, many of you felt a great degree of enthusiasm, yes? But then as you engage the team, you find it very challenging sometimes. You know, the team's not doing what you want, uh, it's not focused in the area that you want it to be focused on and all those kind of things. And I would call all of that demands. Many of you had this idea that you would, you would have something met inside of yourself by engaging the team. But that's not the purpose of the God's Way of Love organisation. The purpose of the organisation isn't selfish. The purpose of the organisation is to be able to develop something and learn something ourselves, but then to be able to give the gift of our love or what we've learnt to others. That's the purpose of the organisation. To do that, you're going to have to learn things you didn't know before. Now, how are you going to do that if you're always sitting in your addiction and always having a certain thing that's your favourite thing and you never look at anything else? Can you see that that's going to be pretty hard to develop a, a wider view of everything if you do that? But rather, if you let yourself see everything that I'm annoyed about in my team, it's covering an addiction that I have. So, and there are many, many of our addictions are related to things like Wanting approval, wanting acceptance, wanting somebody to like us, wanting you know, all these kind of things we didn't get when we were children. A lot of these addictions are trying to meet. So we engage a certain team because of a certain reason in our childhood that's unhealed. In the end, you can see from my own personal involvement in these teams, you can see that I'm passionate about every area. Every team, and many of the team leaders know, Every team, I'm passionate about the area that they're in. And that's because the closer you get to God, the closer you get to God's nature, which is wanting to know everything about everything. <laughs> Just like God does eventually, right? 
So if we can see that every time we don't want to engage the team, so we go along to the team initially, usually this is the, res the process, we get drawn along to the team initially through some reason. Something in our soul draws us there. But as soon as an addiction gets triggered, now we want to leave the team and go somewhere else. Right? So most of us don't want to stay engaged and let ourselves address this trigger. So for example, we go along to the development team and then one day somebody rocks up and starts giving us a two-hour mass tutorial. How would most of you feel about that? Particularly if it went back to grade seven. <laughs> you know, a lot of us would... Because to be frank, many of you, one thing that Justin is knowing is that many of you do not have enough mathematics skill to actually pass a first year high school test. Many of you have lost that skill, right? And one of the reasons why you've lost that skill is because you haven't had to use it much in your life and also you've had no practical examples of where to use it in your life. And so this is where we need to marry up the mathematics, if you like, into these different areas of the different teams because maths are going to be involved in a lot of the teams. And um, when, when AJ came along and did a presentation on electronics to the team, many people go, what's this got to do with what we originally started out doing? And what, what we talked about in the presentation was that if many of you are going to look at developing systems that create energy, you're going to need how to take care with that energy because some of that energy can be quite dangerous. Right? And if you don't understand the underlying principles of how to take care of yourself when you're working with energy, then sooner or later one person's going to die on the team if they're not careful. And so we need to be educated in these particular things. And so th that applies to all teams, not just to the, this team. So my suggestion is, if you, go, you initially feel drawn along to a team and you go there for a few times and then you find, oh, it's not, I'm not interested in that particular subject, Go home, don't, don't affect the team with it, go home and then put that on your list of addictions not being met and ask yourself the question why. What, 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 why do you feel ter so turned off about that particular subject? Is there any other questions like that? David? What sort of things do you envisage being involved in engineering and is there the likelihood of them being combined with live systems and stuff like that? Definitely. Yeah, yeah. So engineering, from my perspective, is about the practical application of scientific knowledge and mathematics. So in the end, we'll, we will have... We haven't found a leader for the science team or the mathematics team yet, but... Uh, but in the end, we hope to have a science team and a mathematics team that find what, what I would call theoretical science and theoretical mathematics. And then, then they connect with the development team and other teams and feed that theoretical mathematics and theoretical science and physics into practical applications. Does that make sense? And the reason why we want to do that is so that we can turn what we learn mathematically and scientifically into real-life situations that then can be utilised over and over again. Now, the world in general is already quite good at that. So, so we'll need to do it in terms of in harmony with more harmony with love. In other words, with live systems that God's already created. And how do we... In, so, so if you think about most engineering today, we get live things and we cut them down and turn them into dead things and then we use them. Huh? Or we get a landscape that's all pristine and beautiful and we bulldoze the top of it and dig holes in it to get out the minerals and other things that we need to produce things. Right? Now, like I said earlier, um, anything that involves the destruction of another thing is not a very loving process. So we need to change on the earth. We need to change the way we do these things. The only way we can change the way is by knowing where to go. So we, we need to have a transitional phase. So where I, how I see it happening from an engineering perspective is here we are right now at 2012 with a certain amount of what I would call electrical, electronic, material and other type of knowledge, right? But most of it... Sorry... 
Most of it um, runs on killing things or destroying landscapes as its basic premise. Right? right down the track sometime, and it doesn't really worry me when, right? the end result is we want whenever this time is, uh, let's say if it's 2050 or something, or, or, or might even be longer, that we have all of these live systems. This is, we're only at the point where we have live systems that have, in, that have what you would call built-in intelligence and understanding. And we need to transition between these two points. So, so we need to help mankind. And to do this, we need to understand ourselves and understand the world around us better. We need to help mankind get from where we are currently to this new location where everything happens in harmony. So this is all about love. It's all about creation only with no destruction. At the moment, huge numbers of things have to be destroyed to live in this society that we're currently living in. This is all about destruction in a lot of ways, of resources. Yep. Here we want no destruction, but we want to be a more advanced civilization. So we want, to, we want to still have heating and cooling and we want to have sewage systems and we want to have all these other things, right? All of these other things that we want for comfortable life that, that is a part of an educated society. We still want all of these things, but we want to do it in such a way that it creates rather than destroys the environment. It actually enhances the environment rather than destroys it. It actually enhances the living things in the environment and how they work rather than destroying them. And to do that, we need to gain, firstly, a lot of information and education. But secondly, we need to go through a process of transition. So I'd call this like a transition process, which moves us from this destructive environment in which we live into a constructive environment, where everything is based around construction, creation, and, and it's all based on live systems that are never destroyed, right? Or if a live system is destroyed, that it's turned into supporting far more live systems, right? Whereas in this one, we destroy a live system only to support more dead systems, more systems that don't have life, yeah? And that, that's, that in the end is going to use up all of mankind's resources and we'll end, we'll end up with nothing if we do that, yeah? So what we need to do is change our focus now. Part of the team's structure will be working our way through changing the focus. Yep. And we've sort of got to start where we're at kind of thing. We've got to start where we're at, but then we've got to move forward in a direction that's more loving, not move forward in a direction that will create more unloving things. Yep. Yep. Christiana, and then down the front here. If you can bring one down here to me. Will sacred geometry have a, um, a role play in this? Of course, but yeah. sacred geometry, what you call sacred geometry, I don't call sacred geometry. Sure. I just call it geometry. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know why anybody calls it sacred because every single thing that God has made mathematical is sacred. Yeah. Do you know, how can you dis like separate what God has made mathematics wise? Mathematics is a highly complex. Uh, investigation area but if we look at mathematics in in entirety mankind is yet to stu really scrape the, the the surface of mathematics mostly because we don't and and are unable to computate what's called multi-dimensional spaces so the biggest problem that we have on earth today is the lack of computational power needed to understand multi-dimensional space and, and this is a part of the soul-based team's investigation, which is all about understanding multidimensional space, space that is not limited by the constraints of time or distance. Right? And, and these are parts of the transitions that need to happen. Now, I would classify all of that mathematics as sacred, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so I don't see just there one, being one thing called sacred geometry. I feel that there are certain types of mathematical systems God's created, <coughs> We need to discover them all, and then we need to put them into practical application. Yeah, yep. sure. Yep. Um, AJ, Living Systems, I, um, I know 
I understood basic living systems, but I struggled with living, um, you know, using houses and things like that as living systems. But somebody sent through within our group, I think it might have been Lizzie, a three-minute um, video clip on a living bridge. Yeah, they were lovely, weren't they? Weren't they brilliant? Yeah. And that opened up the whole new world to me then, yes. what we could possibly do. Now, these people had patience, which was... You know, a beautiful thing. He was but, teaching but his granddaughter how to make these living bridges. And patience is an aspect of love. love yeah. So you see, what, what we uh, wish to do a lot of times in our current society, this society that's just willing to go ahead and destroy things, in this society we want everything to instantly change. We want an instant result. And we want a monetary-based result generally in this society. We've got to get away from all of that way of thinking. We've got to turn this thinking around... And for, for, for that to happen, we've got to turn our thinking around. So we're not going to be able to create this system straight away, particularly if we don't turn around the way we think right, and the way we feel about things. So part of the God's Way of Love team structure is to try and assist people in teams to turn around their thinking, to, to have a far wider scope with regard to what they investigate. And we've got to get away from this idea that we have to continue creating dead systems. We've got to get away from that idea completely because that's not what God does. And, and also, all of God's systems destroy dead systems. So, you know, you look at a, a car, it might look nice, brand new, right, when you first drive it, but you park it outside down by the sea and you just leave it there for five years and you'll soon see that uh, it's already started to decay, right? It's already started to be destroyed. And if you just left it there, there'd be spiders inside of it, there'd be all sorts of animals trying to live inside of it. All, this, all, this, all the living systems are going to use that dead system and try to convert it into something that they can use. We need to create living systems that don't need that to occur. Yeah? That's, that's the focus that we need to have in the long run. That's where we need to be. And so beautiful too. Yeah, it always will end up It beautiful. was so practical and so beautiful and so... Yeah. yeah, I was very moved by that. It was it was a light bulb moment for me of what living yeah. systems can do. Perhaps for the rest of the people who haven't seen it, it was basically a short video talking about some people who live in the highlands in India who um, build bridges across raging torrents of creeks because they, the world record for rainfall in that area is 25 metres a year. And uh, so a lot of rain, and you imagine what would normally be normal, just placid creeks turn into raging torrents during that time. So they build these bridges across the, the creeks, ravines, using, um, what are they called? Figs. Yeah, figs, strangler figs. Yeah. Yeah. And the bridges are so large that they can, they can carry multiple people, uh, stable. They can put rocks on them and make them all nice and <laughs> all sorts of things can happen with these bridges. And they're still alive. Their root systems are still growing. Um, and it's happened over many, many years, of course. And they live past 500 years. Yes, yeah, some of them. They last 500 years. Yeah. yeah. The bridges, because the tree lasts that amount of time, so does the bridge. Yeah. So tree, just build on a live system. Thanks, uh, Justin. Jason. My, my brother's Justin. Ah. <laughs> um, I'm just getting a feeling for the, the whole transition uh, process would be a blend of channeling um, good information, but also uh, as you're clearing your emotions, you'll just know stuff. You will. Knowledge will come to you as you work your way through different blockages that you have. So, so for example, when we start the development team, start a development team, and realise that a lot of people in the team don't have enough mathematical knowledge, right? Then the next step is to challenge the mathematical knowledge. Now, if we don't challenge the mathematical knowledge, you will never ever be able to understand mathematical principles. If we don't under, if we don't challenge why you cannot absorb mass then you're never going to absorb mathematical principles. And that's going to be a bit hard in a development team <laughs> because in the end you want to practically apply mathematical principles. Right? So, so it's going to be very, very difficult for us to, to work ourselves into a new state while we're so resistive to certain parts of our current state. So this is where we're trying, what we're trying to do. We've got a very big picture with these teams. We're, we've got forever <laughs> to work with them. We've got a very big picture. The key is to help each team to begin firstly looking at the emotional blockages, each member in the team, to look at the emotional blockages they have so that they are no longer resistive to, 
things that you're currently resistive to. Like, once you're no longer resistive, then uh, new information and knowledge can come to you yep, through your relationship with God, but also through your relationship with spirits. I would just like to mention about the mediumship team. To be frank with you, the mediumship team is still in a fair mess. And, uh, and we, we are trying, through Jane's assistance, we're trying to make things that, or, or have a little program to help the people who are mediums to get away from this very selfish, addictive focus of their mediumship into a different place altogether. But until that occurs, we can't use the information they collect because the information is unreliable. All right? So it's very, very important if you're a part of that team that you engage the process. And if you don't want to engage the process, that's fine. Don't come along. Don't waste the time of the team leader by coming along if you're not going to engage the process. You remember, please remember, that the team leaders are all volunteers themselves. They are giving you the gift of their time and their love. And myself and Mary and Rob and Andrew, who are the directors at the moment of the God's Way of Love organisation, we are volunteers too. We are volunteering our time with this organisation. So nobody gets paid in the organisation. Everyone's volunteering their time. You must understand that if a person's leading something, they are spending more time than you are on that particular thing generally. And so therefore, at least their time should be respected. We don't want to waste their time. We don't want to, you know, be like many, many of you sometimes get a little bit argumentative with them. You don't need to be argumentative with them. You need to go through a process with them. Does that make sense? And, and if you are argumentative with them, you've got to question how loving you're being. Because these are volunteers who are just volunteering their time and effort to help. That's all they're doing. And many of them have been given very clear instructions from me about where to go and what to do. And when I say from me, from all of the d directors about where to go and what to do with particular team members and so forth. And if you resist that process, you're not just resisting them. Many of you don't respect them enough yet. And so we need to address that as an emotion as well. These are people who are giving the gift of their time and are in a loving, a loving space. They've been chosen because they have a desire and passion for that area as well as a willingness to give their time. They also are willing to grow through the process. They get more feedback than you do in your team. Right. They get more feedback. We have regular meetings once a month around about with the team leaders giving feedback to the, to the team leaders about what's going on with their teams. Are there any more questions that you would like to ask about? All right, well, what I'd like to do now is just focus some attention on some projects that are underway in terms of what we need for different projects. Please understand that we're not asking you to give us what we need. We're just letting you know what we need. Do you see the difference? All right, because a lot of times if we don't know, then we don't do, all right? But we'd like to do, but we don't know what to do and things like that. So what we want to do is give you some feedback about what will be happening with the different teams, um, what projects are going and uh, over a period of time, and what we need for those projects to really come about properly. Um, firstly, most of you now probably know that the people who were the owners of the uh, Learning Centre at Wilkesdale, so here now we're speaking of the projects that the Learning Centre at Wilkesdale is uh, involved in, not the projects that are involved in other learning centres uh, in Australia or overseas. So these are specifically now the projects here in our local area. Um, many of you may now, now realise that um, all of the current owners of the, all of the previous owners of the Learning Centre have come to an agreement that they wish to put the ownership of the Learning Centre into Robert and Angela's hands and Robert and Angela are now living in a shed on the property and building a home that they can live in on the property. They are putting all of their personal resources into that. So, so no money that is donated, that has been donated, has gone to their personal home or any of those kind of things. That's all their personal money that they've put into that project. Um, but there are certain projects that we'd like to do on the centre 
that do require materials or, and or money, either, either one's fine. And we have also, Rob and Ange have, have put in some gov for some government grants to do some beautification projects and we did receive approval for one grant at this point in time. So um, a grant is invol involving the beautification of a certain area on the property and we've already walked over the property to look at what we're going to do with the beautification of that area. The grant was for around about $26,000 um, that Rob and Ange have received and it's specifically to work on the, on the property that they've received it for and to plant certain types of trees and certain types of land in a certain area of the landscape. Now that project will be run by the environment team. But um, involves the, te the development team who will help with the planning of the, of the project itself. And Justin, myself and the guys w walked over the property last week and looked at the different areas of different things that we'd be involved in there. Now, it could involve the other, other, some other teams, obviously, depending on the desire of the other teams. But uh, there are the two teams presently who are involved in that. There's been, uh, of, of the funds that we've been allocated, there's 25,900 associated with that, that location. But it's to do with an area of how big hectare-wise, again, it's seven, seven hectares. So it's... Uh, And if you look at 25 grand spent over seven hectares, it's not very much, <laughs> it's not very much money to do some things. So we've had to be quite careful with what we want to do with it. There'll be, in terms of major projects in that, in that area, there'll be one major project is seed. Um, firstly, seed collection, wouldn't it be be a part of it? I think we decided, was it 80 different varieties we wanted to plant there? Yeah, about. We wanted to try to get 80 varieties. And there's different types of varieties, all natives, they'll all be native uh, to Australia, these varieties, and preferably native to the area as well. Um, there'll also then be a, um, what would we call it, a tube stock? What would we call it in terms of? project is sort of like germination, seed germination. So it's more like a nursery, uh, seed, seed, seed germination. You remember some time ago we bought a system that's a watering system that allows us to uh, soak water, large numbers. We're hoping to germinate the seeds for around about 3,000 trees and shrubs and bushes that we will be planting in that seven hectare area. Um, you know that's a you, don't you? Everyone knows that. Um, we also need to do, uh, uh, there's a project that will be to do with soil preparation. Um, there's around 2,000 square metres of soil of area that we'll actually be planting the trees in and those areas need to be prepared well enough so that they become self-sustaining without needing to be watered at any time. So we need to prepare the soil well to make sure that happens and have a lot of mulch. So that will involve mulching that area. We've already sourced a location where we can get about 500 cubic metres of mulch onto the uh, area and so forth. and. Uh, and that will be a part of it. There will be some dead trees that are coming down. We want to get all of the dead trees on the ground. And, and so we want to, in place, any one of those trees that have hollows, we want, to have we want to have nesting boxes put up in the live trees to compensate for any of the hollows that we've knocked down in the dead trees. Does that make sense? So there, we, the, nursing, the, the uh, nesting box process, we need to... have occurring there as well and eventually it'll get, it'll get planted out it's a two-year project it'll get planted out um, and hopefully we'll see what happens as a result of that now because of it's a it's a 
what, who's the suppliers? Biodiversity. It's a biodiversity project. They have measuring systems that, you know, so there's going to need to be some documentation produced as well about the effectiveness of what we've done. Mary, you want to ask? I just wanted to point out that that money that you've mentioned there that ha has all been needs to be allocated to the first three um, things on your list, and that the nesting boxes are not included in. Yeah, that. nesting boxes are not included in the allocation of those funds, and um, the, the allocation of the funds. There's been very specific terms that have been placed upon us, and so the allocation of those funds have to be given to certain areas, and uh, we've already allocated pretty much all the funds. Um, we had to allocate uh, about $5,000 of the funds to a uh, firefighting system <laughs> um, by, because that's what they wanted us to do. So there's a few things like that that we've had to do um, to allocate. And, and, there's a, and we've tried to also... Um, initially, we were going to buy tube stock rather than doing our own seed collection and germination. But the more we do that, the more mulch we have available for soil preparation. So we focused our area in soil preparation. So Andrew Robert, completely uh, fairly well up to speed with what needs to be done in that project. And uh, the development team also in terms of making little areas where we prepare the soil in areas. And what we're doing is we're only preparing the soil in areas that are damaged. So, so where there is no trees or there's poison in the ground or there's something else happening on, that, on the site, that's where we're preparing the soil. We're not preparing the soil where there's good soil. We're not preparing a location unless it's been damaged in some way. We're trying to leave the pristine locations untouched. Yep. So any questions about that particular project? Rather than, I just want to give an overview of the projects because you can find the details about them from the, the particular teams as they go through. No questions there? Now for that to occur, it would be great if we could have the nursery set up. And that's not a part of that funds that have been allocated. Now, to give you an example, um, in terms of the actual structure of stuff that we need, I've talked to construction team about that, and Gus believes there's about $30,000 of materials that we need to finish the entire structure of the nursery. So remember, uh, somebody, uh, quite a number of different people were involved in donating shipping containers, 40-foot long shipping containers. They will become our storage banks for seed and so forth. They'll also become the basis of a structure for a nursery that we can put all of the, all of the stuff that we grow and see. And what we're hoping to do is have a regular nursery there that will supply, in the end, people in the community and anybody who wants to get natives or, or trees that we've, we've germinated. And they can come along there and just get them for free. That's what we'd like to do in the end. Robert? Uh, I just did a count of the material, the um, seed raising material we have, like the trays and stuff. We could do twenty six thousand trees in one go if yeah. we have the whole system. Completely. If we had the whole system up and running, we yeah. could do twenty six thousand trees. Yeah. yeah, in one go. Yeah, imagine that. So many of you, instead of going down the shop and buying trees and all those other things, eventually what we could be doing is just having a regular, like regular amount of trees all being produced and with that amount of area that we've got if we've got the amount of water we've got we need some piping coming down from a dam there's a few other things that we need and also there's a couple of in terms of uh, piping and other things there's a few thousand dollars as well that will probably go into that so in the end we need around either thirty two thousand dollars or what we need is materials that are usable for that project now, Gary knows the materials, who's the leader of the construction team, knows the materials that are needed in that project. We don't want to receive materials that are useless. Does that make sense? We only want to receive materials that we can utilise. Yep. Now, that project, uh, if we could get that underway soon as well, would mean that we'd have a nursery ready to do a lot of things, not just uh, for this particular project, but we'll be geared up to produce a lot of different things. And, and a lot of your own trees and seedlings could all be produced in that nursery. Yeah? 
So the nursery project, is that's that one. Um, is there any question you'd like to ask about that in terms of what is needed? It's best to find out from the construction team specifically what type of materials are needed for the construction of that project rather than speak with me about that. Gary, so Gary, if you can just stand up so everyone knows who they have to go to. That's Gary, for those of you who don't know. And uh, just go to Gary and, and talk to him. If you've got... If you have materials that you feel that you'd like to donate to that particular project, Gary will know whether he can use them or not. Yeah. By the way, we're happy for people to, rather than donate money, to actually donate the materials. So, in fact, we'd prefer that in a lot of ways. The reason why we'd prefer that is from an accounting perspective in the organisation, we can receive materials and we don't have to account for them. But if it's money that we receive, we have to account for the money that we receive and therefore pay and pay out. So obviously that just creates more time for somebody to account for. So if somebody's willing to go out and just get the materials and bring and, and, and we get them there, that's easier sometimes for us than actually getting the money. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. David? Hey Joe, I, I'm not sure whether it's an appropriate question here. Mm -hmm. um, but the uh, the thought came to mind, if if uh, as an organisation we're gifting stuff, um, that's likely to raise conflict within the community, like people that that sell trees, for instance. Do you want to say anything about that? <laughs> well, naturally, when we get into more harmony with love, there will be the triggering of different emotions in other people. I agree. But that's not a good reason to stay out of harmony with love ourselves. Right? Many of you are still very afraid of engaging loving actions because of the backlash that you fear will come from other people. Now, that's got to somehow be challenged because, because people who are going to lead this world into a new way of living are going to need to have a far bigger picture in their head than just, oh, I might get hurt by somebody if I do this. So that's a very selfish motivation. So, so what we want to do is start addressing our fears. Now, many of you are still expressing your fears rather than addressing your fears. Right? And even that question, David, is an expression of a fear rather than an addressing of a fear. The fear is... What might happen in the community? Well, if I'm always loving to the community, I can only assume that good things will happen, surely. Now, in the transitional phase, there may be negative responses, but sooner or later they'll all realise that this is a great system because it means that they get things for free too. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And they get a gift given to them. But, but while we stay in fear and go, oh, but if I do that, then certain members of the community might feel like this or might feel like that, and so forth and so forth. And if we start feeling along those lines, then that's going to have just create momentum in the, in the same way the world is already headed now, which is all fear-based and all money-based and all, you know, and this is the reason why we do all of the things we do. We need to confront these fears rather than living in them. So, so to be frank, um, while I have compassion for people who live in fear, I cannot agree with it. Yeah. So if, somebody, if I'm giving away something and somebody else is complaining about that, then uh, I'd be saying to them, well, I'm giving it away. That's more loving than what you're doing. And uh, I, you know, I can't have, uh, while I can have compassion for their fear, I can't agree with them living in their fear. Yeah. And that shouldn't change my behaviour. Should it? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it, it sounds sounds great, you know, having everything gifted and whatnot. But it's like, yeah, I don't want to go through the the, the transition. Yeah, it's interesting that many people have come to me saying, oh, "I'd like to bring my business in harmony with divine love," and I say, "Okay, step number one: gift everything." That's step number one. And you know what the first response is? How can I do that? People won't know what to donate to me. Like, what if they don't donate anything? I'll give everything away and I'll be left with nothing. I said, yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. But if you, can't, if you can't do number one, 
How are you ever going to get to number two? <laughs> In turn, I mean, you know what people want to do? They go, gift everything. Yeah, I don't like that idea at all. Right, so what they do instead is they go, what's the second thing? <laughs> well, if you think the first thing's hard, what do you think the second thing's going to be like? <laughs> Can you see? As you see, most of us are just like, we're not even willing to do the first thing that's going to bring it into harmony with love. And, and what I feel we need to do is, you, you know, we need to learn issues of trust. We need to trust in God. We need to learn to trust in our neighbour. We need to learn to trust in the goodness of people. We need to encourage the goodness of people. You know, these are things we all need to learn to do at some point in our future. And, and if we start personally gifting everything that we do, sooner or later we will have to come to a point where we start to trust something other than ourselves in order to continue doing it. Right? But what, what's happening for a lot of people is they ask me, well, I want to bring my, you know, you know remember in the previous uh, talk I gave about the Constitution, I said that any person with any business, with any property, could ask us to assist them with bringing it into harmony with God's love, right? In the way God would do anything. And the very first thing that, they, that I ask them to do is to gift everything. Very, very few people have actually done that. There's some really good examples in the audience of who have done it, but very few people have actually done it, particularly with a business. Very few people. And the reason why? It is a very difficult emotional transition to make. To make that emotional transition, you're going to have to work through a lot of your issues about money, a lot of your issues about trust, a lot of your issues about trusting God, a lot of your issues about trust in your own abilities, a lot of issues about uh, whether you're going to receive what, enough to survive. All of these things you're going to have to work through at some point. And, and the beauty of gifting everything, turning everything into just a gift, is that, is that in the end you'll have to address every one of those emotions. So you know when people take from you and then, and then they just take from you again and then they take from you again and then you end up with nothing and they end up with everything you had, then you'll have to work through an emotion to work through, well, why are you allowing people who are not loving you to take from you? Why are you giving things in that manner where you allow a person to continue receiving a gift after and a gift again and a gift again and a gift again without you addressing their selfishness? You see, it's, you imagine if you had a child and you gave them one gift, right? And to that child... He doesn't even have time to appreciate that one gift and he wants another one from you. Now as soon as he wants one from you, he's got a problem, hasn't he? That's out of harmony with love. Because what's a gift? A gift is something that can't be demanded and that's given with your will, given with free will. So as soon as somebody demands a gift from you, let's say that's the gift, as soon as a person demands that gift from you, now I can't give it. Can you see? If I love them, I can't. I've got to talk to them first about why they're demanding a gift. And then after a time period goes past, then I might be able to give them a gift again once I realise that their demand has disappeared. Does that make sense? Now many of you are unwilling to address that in other people. You give them a gift and then they have it, crea it creates a selfish demand because a lot of people, when they get a gift, they go, wow, I got something for free. That's very unusual. And so then they want another thing for free and another thing and another thing and another thing. And if we keep giving it to them like that, now we're supporting their demand for a gift. Now, they, if they're demanding a gift, how can I give them and still stay in a state of love of them? I can't. So, so I need to learn to recognise when people are, are demanding a gift from me and go, I'm sorry, but you're actually demanding it now. You need to deal with something before I can give you a gift. You need to deal with this demand that you have. Yeah? You notice that that's what myself and Mary are doing with many of you, even just emotionally. Many of you come up with your demands about, I want some of your time, I want some of your energy, I want some of your space and so forth. And what, what do we finish up doing? 
We fin- if, we, if we're not careful, we keep giving the gift, giving the gift, giving the gift, giving the gift and feeling exhausted at the end without recognising that we're not honouring ourselves and we're also not loving them because, it, because we're turning them into monsters. We don't want to turn other people into monsters. We want to turn other people into loving individuals. <laughs> right? So we need to uh, gift everything and once you gift everything, you will find, and it comes from an attitude from your heart, and you start trusting it, uh, you'll find other people will give, give things to you. You will find that. It's an automatic process, actually. Yeah? And in the end, you'll be able to live off of it. And, then, and after, the, after you live off it, you'll become very wealthy. <laughs> but not materially, necessarily. You'll become wealthy in the sense that you don't need to worry about money anymore. Because you know that everything you need will be given to you at some point. Just like every time you notice somebody else needing something, you give them something. And sometimes you give them things even if they don't need it, right? Of course. So we just need to address those emotions, yeah? So our suggestion with a lot of these uh, projects that we've got underway is that if you approach them from the point of view of gifts, please understand that we're not saying you have to be involved in anything. Remember, this is all about your will, all about engaging your free will in a loving manner. You don't have to be involved in a single, single thing. Right? But if you are going to get involved, come with the attitude of wanting to give. And even if you've got no resources at all, there's still a resource that every single one of us has. Time. So we can give the gift of some of our time. Now, I know some of you are very busy and you don't feel you've got much time <laughs> to gift. And that's understandable. I understand that life is sometimes very uh, difficult. And sometimes we're so busy trying to make ends meet ourselves that we uh, feel there's nothing that we've got left to give. And I feel that is also an emotion, a feeling of hopelessness and that, that, that sometimes comes over us. Shall I continue? Yep. So, so far we've listed two projects. There's this project, which was an environment team project. There was the nursery project, which is an environment team uh, project, and a construction team project as well. And then the third... Now, we're talking on here only about the bigger projects, uh, not the smaller ones that we've got arranged. The third big project is the cleared area on the Learning Centre which we're turning into a small animal and small bird uh, sanctuary, I suppose you'd call it. Sanctuary or rary? Rary. So... um, that is already underway, as you know. I don't know if you realise, if you've been up there recently, but uh, there's about 40 or 50 small um, double bar finches that have moved in to that area now and they're breeding in that area. As soon as we put the little water uh, um, dam in that area, um, which somebody, one of you, donated to us to do, um, within about a month of doing that, these birds just came and stayed. And they're bu- rapidly building nests and everything and breeding there now, which is really, really good to see. So what we want to do is enhance that area a little further. The main air- way we ha- enhance it is by digging some what we would call uh, fertility holes in the ground and actually putting matter into those holes. And when I say matter, we're talking about anything that will decompose. And uh, so... Now... Part of the problem we've found in the community is that once we present something to you, many of you individually go around looking for that particular thing. And what we find is, a, so for example, we say, oh, we all need, we need some uh, cardboard. So individually, many of you then go around looking for cardboard and in the end, the poor, the poor um, shop owners who get deluged with your <laughs> request feel very frustrated of hearing all these requests for cardboard from, from 20, 30 different people, right? So what we need to do is be far more organised than that 
in the future with regard to resources. So if we are looking for something from the, like if we're looking for paper or cardboard, it would be better to go via the environment team. The environment team have a person who, who is responsible for that and every person who, who has got something to give can go to that person. Any person that wants to go and pick up cardboard from anywhere or paper from anywhere can go firstly to that person to make sure it's not already being done right, by somebody else. Because if, if, if not, we're going to end up with a lot of unfortunate, unhappy shop owners who, who, uh, who are being requested, th of who, from whom things are being requested that, uh, from different individuals and it takes up a lot of their time and their resources which wouldn't be very kind to them. But basically what we need is any decomposable matter. So if you've got uh, any decomposable rubbish, um, if you ha could have a bin that you create that we can just fill up the bin and then bring it over to the sanctuary and just chuck it in a hole. We want any decomposable matter at all. Paper, cardboard, any of your household uh, litter, that, any of your household paper, any of your household cardboard, any, anything, that, anything that's decomposable, not plastic, not wrapped in plastic, anything that's got plastic taken off of it, anything that you've got. Yeah? And even like your rubbish, like, you know, like your vegetable rubbish and so forth, if you're willing to bring it along, bring it along, get chucked in the holes. <laughs> yeah? Because what we want to do is create a little ecosystem at each hole that attracts a lot of insects and attracts a lot of uh, birds as well. And in the process of doing that, the, the holes will also fill up with, uh, with water and minerals and those minerals will slowly leach down the side of the hill and that will feed all of the other vegetation on the hill and we'll be able to then plant some very, very interesting plants, native plants through that area uh, and have them grow very rapidly as a result of what we do. Yeah. Tristan, you had a question? Uh, no? Um, at the back. Um, sorry about my Geraldine. memory today. Geraldine. Geraldine, thanks. Um, AJ, I just wanted to ask, um, all the junk mail that lands in your letterbox, is that actually poisonous to the ground or do you want that as well? All the junk mail is fine um, as long as you take out any plastic. So okay. plastic windows and all those kind of things that we, we can't use that much. <laughs> but, but, you know, even the... Um, even the junk mail that's got a lot of colour in it, all we need to do there is just, just bind it up a little and, uh, and just leave it out in the weather for a few weeks or a month and it usually already starts the decomposing process and then we can throw it in a hole. So, so do you want us to do that before yeah. we give it to you? Like, um, but then you wouldn't want to just leave it on the ground so that it runs into the ground, would you, and poison you? Well, uh, a lot ground. of it does have some chemical, but... Th th the ground is perfectly able to uh, to deal with a lot of this stuff and turn it if we use living material. So, so for example, what we've been doing at home is our worms actually eat all of our all of the paper that comes into our house is eaten by worms. So, what we want to do at each one of these little fertility holes is make them into little worm farms that we can just keep putting matter, and as long as it, as long as the worms can eat it, it'll all go eventually. Thank you. Yep. Lorne? Stand front. Uh, does that mean, AJ, that we have to take out the um, lemon and onion peels and... Oh, that's okay too, for the, yeah, for the worms? Yeah, well, well, you wouldn't normally put it in a worm farm if you had a concentrated worm farm, but because of these are holes that would be quite large that are going to be dug, it really doesn't matter what we put into them as long as it can decompose. And, and if the worms don't eat it, the other insects and things will. So, so in the end, we want as many insects as possible on the property, yep. eating up all of this matter. Yep. Morning. I'll close. It's Renee. Um, uh, just one thing on the um, paper. I've gone blank. 
um, they use a lot of soy-based um, inks on the yes. paper. Yes. So they're not very toxic. Yep. But the only thing that makes it decompose slower is the wax that they put on. So exactly. Exactly. And that's why if you leave it out in the sun a bit, it all... Yeah, thanks, Renee. Chef? Uh, leave your hand up, Chef, so people can see. Yep. I just um, noticed in the early stages all the round timber got bulldozed into a heap up there. Is there any plans to try and salvage any of that or are you just going to leave it for habitat? No, if you have a look it up there now, the trees are around that timber are now higher than the timber. Okay. And, and actually that habitat is what a lot of these birds are now nesting in. Oh, yep. Yep. So, yeah, we just want to change the structure of how the water is collected up there. At the moment it's running down and not being caught. But, that's, uh, but we're not going to, again, we're focused on the ground that's bare, not on the ground that's already got something on it. So we, we're focused only on fixing the areas that are bare rather than fixing all of the areas that are already in recovery. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. So with that, it's more just a matter of a bit of time that's needed and effort. And if you know of anybody who has spare bales of hay that they want to give away because it's all rotten or whatever else, we're happy to go and pick all that up as well. Just, just lo lots of stuff like that that we can utilise and um, that perhaps nobody else can utilise but we can put in these holes. Yep. Again, um, if you can coordinate some efforts through Rob and Ange rather than rather than going individually to different places because that's what uh, eventually causes a lot of feelings in the persons that you're going to <laughs> of, being, of being annoyed or frustrated. Yep. Rob? Oh, we don't have it sorted yet, but we're hoping in the future to have a pick-up point in um, probably Wandai. And just have a trailer there for maybe half a week, once a month, so yep. people can just store up their stuff. Yep. Then we'll just, yeah, we'll have half a week. Everyone can bring their stuff there and just get rid of it all in one go. Yeah. Rather than hanging around for a long time and yep. being a hassle for one person. Stuff. Exactly. Yeah. We haven't More sorted we it yet, but we're, we're heading towards that direction. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And uh, you also, that reminds me too, you also really need an old trailer on the property, don't you? That's not registered, it doesn't need to be registered just for carting things around on the property. Yeah, that way we can use our registered trailer to do other things. Yeah. yeah it, it's getting tied up a lot. Yeah. That we can't use it to do other things we want to do. Yep. Yeah. So if anybody does have an unregistered trailer that, that is in decent enough repair to tow around in, on the property, then if they could let Rob and Ange know. Yeah. Okay. Um, have we created an email address for you guys? I think I have, but I haven't given it to you, so I'll have to do that before I go away. Joy? Joy? Um, it's almost possible it could be a community project to um, encourage residents in Kingaroy as well as Wandai to and do like a, a paper and cardboard collection yeah, at the basis. moment in the entire community, I don't think there is any separation no. of uh, waste, is there, uh, in the entire community? Yeah. And it would be lovely if, if, if one of the things we could eventually do is separate waste in, into decomposable waste mm. because uh, the, the reality is it would help all of the landfill areas mm. but it would also um, mean that we could use all of that waste on different projects because mm. it... it Particularly in some of the heavy clay and sandy soil areas, um, using these this kind of waste has a huge benefit to to yeah. the um, you know to the to, to the property that you're doing it with. Eventually, what we want to do with the environment team, like many of the other teams, is we want to give the gift of their effort to the community. Mm. And one of the things that uh, I've been trialling on my own property is how to rapidly fix up a system that's been badly damaged. And, uh, and some of the effects we've had up to now have been really awesome. Like uh, we've just got this project of digging holes and then putting them full of matter. Mm. As I mentioned in our, in our last meeting, uh, you know, when we, when we showed the Back to Eden video. And, uh, and already we're having far more birds on the property, a lot more insects on the property. 
and uh, it's having a market effect already and we haven't even finished the holes yet. Like, mm. So it's having a really good effect right across the board. Yeah. I just wonder whether it's something that um, some of the schools might be happy to be engaged in. Yeah. So that they yeah. could bring the stuff to school. It might be just a once a month pick up or something. Yeah. And then there's the educational possibility that we could uh, actually teach them what we're doing and what the results are. And yeah, yeah. Mm. I feel all of these things are part of the things that teams can engage, yeah. but it needs to be in an organised fashion. We don't want to uh, cause people in the community to feel like, you know, feel like they're being oppressed, but rather just if, uh, if they want to engage a process. Mm. Uh, I feel there are a lot of people in the community who do ask the question of what happens with their mm. uh, decomposable waste. And, uh, but unfortunately, you see, in today's liturgious society as well, we've actually gone to certain places who would normally throw away their waste and have to take it to the dump, and they're not willing to give it to us because we're, they've given it to other people in the past, and then it's caused some kind of damage to some stock that they were feeding it to or something like that, and then the person's gone back upset with them or angry with them or even threatening to sue them and so forth. So, so you know, part of the problem has been that people in the past have had a bad experience and so they don't want to engage another one, another bad experience. So before we let th loose things on the community, like I say, we need to make sure that we've got it all working ourselves first so that, so that we're, it's not all a great big trial and error. We, we want to get to the point where we've gotten rid of all the errors before we involve the general community in something because if we can do that, then the general community is always going to benefit markedly from what we do. Yep. Okay. All right, so there are the three main projects that we're working on on the Learning Centre itself. Of course, every single team has its own projects that it's working on. In addition to this, um, we've been uh, interesting, it's been interesting to see what's been going on with the different teams, actually, in terms of emotions, but also in terms of uh, what different teams can accomplish compared to, compared to others. What we've also said to the team leaders is we want to notice... Uh, and if I can go through with you just something basic about the teams, um, which is important to notice from a, from a, more from a psychological or emotional process, is this. When we first talk about the team, we usually have a large group of people who say they're enthusiastic for that particular team. So we call that the initial group. Now, of that group, what we've actually found is this. The, the group can be broken into three main areas. The first group of people are the people who are sincere. Now, the people who are sincere are not selfish. In other words, they don't have selfish motivations for being involved in the team. They have the desire to give. They have the desire to learn, and they are very, very humble. And as a result, they're very, very easy to teach. The second group of people are the people who are selfish. In other words, they have a selfish motivation for being involved in the group. Right? So the selfish motivation will be the satisfaction, personal satisfaction, uh, the satisfying of an emotional addiction, the, um, the, the feelings they want to get from the group, and they have an attitude of taking from the group. The third group of people we've found who are attracted to the group are the people who are spirit influenced. The main spirit influence at the beginning of a group is the spirits don't want the group to happen. <laughs> so we get a whole heap of people, we get some of you, some of you have been involved in this by the way, um, who are spirit influenced, often uh, out of their body while they're present, while they're present in the uh, meetings. They often are there to feed the addictions of the spirits.
and they only feel satisfied when the spirit's addictions are fulfilled. Right? Now, can you see our role is sorting this out? Because in the end we want everyone possible being in there, <laughs> in that group. One of the reasons why we're going through a process with all of the teams is that we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to weed out the people who are just coming along just to influence the group from a spirit perspective, who have, have spirits with them, who are just there wanting to get some control over the group. These, these ones often want control. Then there are a group of people who come to any team who just have primarily a selfish motivation. In other words, they're there because they have a, a desire to be there to meet some of their own passions and desires, but not to, for any purpose of giving. Now, I'm perf perfectly happy to have a person like that set up their own group in some other organisation. But in the God's Way of Love organisation, um, can... You just open the door and tell whoever that is to stop bashing on the door. Um, so in the God's Way of Love organisation, we want to make sure that we have lo no people who are selfish and no people who are spirit-influenced and lots of people who are sincere, who are helping the group. Now, what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop little projects that help the team leader sort out who's in what group here of these particular people. Does that make sense? That's what we're trying to do. What we're finding like with the mediumship team, with the mediumship team for example, almost every person coming fits into that category. So that is a problem. And that's a problem that myself and Jane are trying to address through a process of what Jane is going to show you and teach you through that process. We've also found with the arts team that that is the case. And so what we've done with every team is we're trying to help the team leaders identify the people who are sincere first and to meet more often with the people who are sincere. So in other words, there'll be certain times where the team what doesn't meet as a whole but rather there will be a core group of people in the team who meet because we feel that those particular people are more sincere. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, we're not trying to punish you or anything like that. We're just trying to get things started as rapidly as possible. If we allow these people and these people to influence the time of the team leaders so much that these people don't get a hearing, then at the end of the day, very little will get done that's positive. So what we're trying to do is focus the team leader's attention on the people who are sincere coming along to the team. Does everyone get that as to why that's happening? We want to address the selfish emotions in the rest of the team or the spirit-influenced emotions in the rest of the team. But when I say address, we're not the team leaders, it's not the responsibility of the team leaders to, to tell you why it's like it is. They can only, they, all, all we've told them to do is to say, this is what it feels like to me, you need to leave now and work it out. Does that make sense to everyone? Because we don't want to chew up the team leader's time addressing other people's emotional injuries. Because we all have a personal responsibility to address our own injuries. We don't want to have to make somebody reliant on another person to address their emotional injuries or if I could make it more clear, we don't want to have it so that the team leaders, are invest their total time is just invested in correcting the issues of unloving behaviour. What we want to do is engage the most loving members of the team in a process. Once that group there that it would say is the most loving members of the team is working well, then we can involve these members with the team more. And these people here will be able to help those people work through their selfish behaviour. And, and we can involve these people more once this team is functioning, once this core group is functioning, and they will help these people deal with their unloving behaviour. Right? 
So that's the approach we're trying to take. Initially, we try to help everybody, but the team leaders get exhausted doing that, and it's not very positive uh, in terms of outcomes either. So that's what we've been doing with the teams. Has anybody got any questions about that? Karen. It just struck me that it's a modern day version of the parable of the sower and his seed. Sorry, if, say that again. I didn't hear you. If you can speak a bit more closely. Um, the parable of the sower and his seed. Yes, yeah. exactly. So some people have an initial enthusiasm, but then they get waylaid by spirit influence. Some people have an initial enthusiasm, but it's selfish in its orientation. Some people have an initial enthusiasm and it's sincere. And what we'd like to do is work with the people who are sincere. And just like that parable, um, there was those four types of people. People are also influenced by others. So, so we probably should draw another, the fourth part of the parable, which are the group of people that are influenced by the fear of their environment. So, so when I say fear, many of us are still influenced by what the community thinks of us, by what other people in the community think of us, right? And as a result of that, we're afraid of what people will say. And so we don't engage our passions just because of what people might say about it, right? And that's the fourth group of people who are just living in fear. And those people, while they might be sincere, they need their fear challenged. Because we, we need to stop living in fear and live in desire instead. Yeah? So I'll just draw that as an inclusion of this little box. So those four groups of people, of those four groups of people, those three groups we want to help but we can't invest huge amounts of time without having a team of people that can help them. And this is why the team leader is focusing on a group of people who are sincere first, even if it's one person. <laughs> they spend more time with that one person until that person says, and then there's two people to help the rest of the team. And if those two people can spend a bit of time with another person they notice who's sincere, then there'll be three people who can help the team and so forth. Until we get, eventually people coming along in any condition and immediately there's somebody who can assist them in the team. Yeah. But of course everything has to start small, start ha how it is currently. Yeah. Any other questions you have about that? Is, have I made it clear as to what we're attempting to do? Yep. Does everyone feel that's pretty unfair? Can you see that if you're the team leader, you think that's really good? <laughs> but if you're a person who's spirit influenced, you might not think that's very good. Um, so understand that we've got a reason for doing all of these things. We're not trying to be partial or anything like that. What we're trying to do is engage the people who are sincere in a state of love and wanted to learn and are humble. And once we help those people understand what we're trying to do, then these, these people can help us help those people. Yeah? So, Renee? So would you recommend that um, if, if there is a desire to go along to a team meeting, but I'm noticing that oh, I'm a bit selfish or I'm a bit spirit influenced, but I know I've got a desire to just stay away and deal with my stuff and let the team... No, I, I would engage the team, but I'm telling you from the team leader's perspective what they'll do with you. So if they, so if they say, oh, Renee, you've got a lovely desire there, that's really, really good, and they then en engage you on a bit of a you know, project, and then they realise that most of the time Renee's out of her body when she's working on a project, right? That she's not even really present half the time, and half the time it seems like somebody else is there in her place inside of Renee's body, then they can say to her, look, Renee... You're a pretty spirit-influenced, actually. And, and until you address this spirit-influenced issue, it's going to be hard to spend more time with you helping you. So they can still help you. They can just identify the issue, but it's not their responsibility to help you deal with it because that's your responsibility to, to address that issue. So um, I would, if it was me and I'm a member, if, if I was a member of a team, I would engage the team to the best of my passion and best of my ability at the time and then allow and just trust that whatever interactions happen with the team leaders, 
is, is has been discussed probably a lot with myself, Mary, and Robin Ange, and and so you know we we get together regularly, and we also get together with the team leaders w w when they want us to or when they need us to, and we discuss you know members in the team and the different influences they have, and how we can assist each member of the team. Does that make sense? And sometimes the way to assist the members of the team is to spend less time with the person who's spirit influenced, more time with somebody who's sincere, and then when this person who's spirit influenced no longer wants to be spirit influenced, then they'll start addressing why they're so desperate for the spirit to be overcloaking their behaviour. Does that make sense? If the person who's selfish is doing it and we address the issue, here's some selfishness, and the person goes, well, I don't want to be involved in the team, then they say, that's fine, you're allowed to continue being selfish for as long as you like. Um, we're, we're just here in the team trying to engage unselfish behaviour because that's what we're doing. We're do in God's way of love, what we're trying to do is practice God's way of love, not, not our own way of love. So we feel eventually, in the long run, what will happen is sooner or later, every single person involved in the teams will eventually work through one of these three major areas that is inhibiting their ability to give to the community, to, to give to others, and to work in harmony with others. Because to work in harmony with others, we need to be humble. We need to have a spirit of learning. And we need to uh, be willing to give and not be selfish. These are all... These are all really good qualities, by the way. I must remind you that these are qualities that are necessary if you're ever going to be at one with God. So, so these are qualities we want to engage. And once we engage them, uh, then I feel what will happen is the people in these different groups will... Like, for the people who are afraid, they'll go, Oh, yeah, I was asked to do that job, but the only reason why I didn't do that job because my next-door neighbour would have seen me doing it and then they would have said such and such or my family would have seen me doing it and then they would have said some things to me and I didn't want to engage that and so then the team leader knows well you're in fear and you need to go and deal with your fear about you know being truthful <laughs> and and really you can't help until you've dealt with that because we want a group of people who uh, understand the truth within themselves and who have enough honor of themselves and their own understanding to be to stand strong in any circumstance and situation that's what we want. And stand strong in the sense of, you know, if there's opposition from others, stand strong if there's spirits around who are influencing them, and to also be firm with themselves about their own selfish behaviour, to, to stop accepting their own selfishness. And uh, we feel quite strongly that if we can do those three things with the teams, then what will finish up happening is we'll end up with a core group of people who are very sincere, and when we get a core group of people who are very sincere, all working in the same direction, they're going to accomplish some pretty good things, no matter what they're doing. Yep. Thank you. No worries. Any other questions? So do you get the idea of what we're trying to achieve? Yep. Good. So um, what we've found in some groups in particular, there are heavy spirit influence and heavy selfishness. So... The, the arts team in particular has a heavy selfish focus, or has had, and the mediumship team has had a heavy selfish focus. Both of those teams, because of their heavy selfish focus, have also had a heavy amount of spirit influence right, as well, which we're attempting to address through a process. This is why um, we need to... And this, is, this kind of process will happen with all of the learning centres worldwide. There's already... There'll be, we're talking to a group of individuals setting up a learning centre at Bathurst next weekend or weekend after next. And there's a, a learning centre that's now set up in Sweden, in overseas. And so, you know, every learning centre that does get established around the world will all have this focus in terms of helping the team members. We want to get a core group of people who are passionate who are willing, humble, willing to take direction in love and those group of people then help others who come along to that team. If we don't do it that way, if we do it any other way, we'll have to make rules and all that, which we don't want to do. We, we want to focus on just helping people have a feeling of love and once people get that feeling of love in their heart, then you'll be unstoppable. Team-wise, the team will be unstoppable. Okay. 
So this is one thing that myself and Mary have noticed a lot happening, isn't it, darling? How we've sort of noticed the different, you know, the primary things that are occurring, the fear, the spirit influence and the selfishness have all been occurring in the teams and we really do want you to sincerely address them. And if you're a member of the arts team and the mediumship teams, then we need you to understand that you are some of the people we're speaking of here. Yep. In terms of understanding, there is a deep need for, for, both of those, for people in both of those teams in particular to begin addressing their selfish-based emotions their spirit and their spirit influence, which is a lot about their fears as well. But there is often a heavy spirit influence in the wrong direction in those teams. Yep. Now, in the arts team, there is now a core group of people who are pretty passionate about doing what they're doing and already they're having some success in the community as well in terms of giving their gift to the community and members of the community appreciating that gift that they're giving. And, uh, and you know, perhaps what we'll do in one of the next sessions is give you some examples of that so that you know some of the things that are happening in the community as a result of people who are, had to be in the sincere place. With the arts team, what I did, I don't know if you've noticed, but I, I finished up choosing just a core group of people who I feel that I could work with in terms of music in, in particular, because that's one of my passions as well. And, and so I got a core group of people that I worked with. And remember that core group of people presented to you last session, last month. We had the Saturday and Sunday where we did a whole song and dance routine with you guys. Um, how did you find that presentation? <laughs> Was it good? Yeah. You'll find the more the core group of people are out of their addictions, the better you'll feel when you come along to something like that. Now, when I say the better you feel, many times with music and the arts in particular, we are addicted to certain things. And, uh, and that does need to be addressed. So what we're trying to do with those two teams in particular is remove as much of the spirit influence and selfishness and fear out of the teams as we can. Yep. Now, they're also engaging uh, down at Kentucky, at the Learning Centre down there, they're also engaging the same process with the arts team. And it's interesting with the arts team down there that initially it started off, again, a very large team. And I think at the moment it's now shrunk to very, very small team. <laughs> um, because we've asked uh, Fabio, the man who's leading that team, to be very specific on the same issues. And so many of the people who were coming along initially wanting their addictions fed, they're not getting their addictions fed and so they're feeling quite challenged and they don't want to come to the team anymore. And like I've said to Fabio, that, you know, as long as, even if you end up with only three or four people in the end in the team who are sincere, those three or four people are going to be able to create a lot of very beautiful things together. Right. But if you have a whole big team, which is all this influence and fear and selfishness and everything else, you can, you, can you see it's going to be very hard to create anything that's really beautiful in the end? Because all of that fear, selfishness and, and spirit influence has to be worked through first before anything can be created. Okay. No more questions? No? Do you have any questions about anything to do with God's way of love, organisation? Awesome. <laughs> that means our session is finished. <laughs> um, if I can just uh, fill in, you in on what's happening with myself and Mary over the next few weeks so you can understand what's going on. Um, on f Monday we're leaving to uh, drive, we're doing a driving trip this time. We're driving down to Armada. We've spent a few days just mentoring the uh, learning centre managers there. We then drive down to uh, Sydney and we're doing Saturday and Sunday next weekend, Saturday and Sunday in Sydney. There'll be a seminar Saturday and Sunday in Sydney. And then we drive up to Bathurst and the following weekend there'll be a seminar Saturday and Sunday in Bathurst. And there is also a group of people there who want to set up a learning centre, so we'll be meeting with those during the week. And then after we've done that, we drive back up to uh, Armadale and uh, to the learning centre there in Kentucky. And there'll be a Saturday and Sunday presentation there on, at the learning centre in, in Armadale. If uh, you come along to that, you'll need to rug up. 
going to be very cold. <laughs> and because uh, it will probably be in their wool shed, so it won't be warm. So you'll need to make sure you're rugged up. And then we uh, drive home uh, after that. We're here for, it's looking at this point in time like a period of two weeks, uh, during which time Mary will run one book group, two book groups, and I'll do a couple of interviews, and we may have one two hour seminar. And, and then it's looking like we, we will be going to Brazil. Um, we, and the way it's worked out is looking like we'll be going around the world again, actually, not just to Brazil. So um, we've been, uh, the, there's been a lot of things happening in Brazil and overseas uh, about divine truth. And um, we have been just letting people know what's happening. And, and one person in Australia donated enough funds for us to be able to do a around-the-world trip to those, to those locations that are needing it. So that was really good. And, uh, and we'd like to thank them for that. That's uh, been wonderful. So that meant we've got enough funds to go from here to Sweden. We'll be spending probably a week in Sweden at this point. And remember, anybody hearing this, it's still unorganised. <laughs> so we're not sure it's certain about what, where we'll be going. We'll be going. But we will be going to Sweden. Uh, we then expect that we'll be going to the east coast of the USA, um, where we'll probably spend a week. And then we'll head south, um, potentially to Mexico. Uh, we'll be doing some presentations in Mexico. And then down to Brazil, where we'll be having two to three weeks in Brazil. Um, sorry? Oh, and we might go via Costa Rica yet, so it'll be Mexico, Costa Rica, Brazil. Um, we may squeeze in little things here and there around that, but that's the general plan at this point in time. And then we'll probably two or three weeks in Brazil and then home. We'll be probably home around the 20th of August or something like that. So um, around that figure, isn't it? You just did the mess. Doesn't quite squeeze in. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't quite squeeze in there. No. Um, so what we're hoping to do, we'll be leaving probably on the 7th of July or something, like, or the, we, the 9th of July, I think it might be, and getting home around the 22nd or something of August. And uh, so we'll, the only time we'll have available here will be two weeks when we get back from our trip down south. Um, so there'll be a lot squeezed into that two weeks, uh, I think, for us. Um, but we'll try to put uh, the details on the website. By the way, I've been spending uh, the last week or so working on the website, um, day and night, as Mary knows. And uh, I hope to have a new website up and running by next week sometime. Uh, it's, a, its layout is different. It's a bit easier to find information. And it's a bit easier for a first-time person coming to the site to actually find everything. We've also in the process of changing the way we upload things to YouTube and changing the layout on YouTube, which you'll already see some changes to. And uh, we've done that because we want to increase the exposure when you do searching and so forth. Uh, so now, uh, as, as once I finish it, it'll be a process that will take uh, three or four days of work. And once it's finished, then the, the whole YouTube site will be fairly different to use, use as well. Um, so we're hoping to do these things because myself and Mary feel that things are just poised at the moment to grow quite a lot and uh, we really need to be, we're, try, uh, we're trying to get organised is probably the best way to put it. So myself and Mary have been working and a small group of people have been working on our office, trying to get our office sorted out over the last few days as well. So at the moment our house is like piled this high with stuff um, which we hope to sort out in the next day and a half before we leave. <laughs> we'll see how we go with that. But the other things that we're doing, um, the main reason why we're doing those things, as I've pointed out, is that we want to make it easier for people to find information and we want to make it easier for people to, uh, to sort of be presented or, or led through information as well. We're also, there are many people around the world now starting to want to set up what are called groups, like just groups of learning. And uh, we're trying to assist people to set up groups in different areas as well as a part of the process. One of the things we're hoping to do as well is to create a sort of a study, a study material on the net. 
so that anybody who's new to the divine truth material can sort of go through a process of seeing the material, the underlying basic teachings and so forth that we're trying to present and, uh, and also teach it in a group setting or as an individual uh, online. We just feel that we need to provide a way to support people who want to practice love more in their lives and so that's what we're doing there as well. It's my pleasure. Thanks. So we're hoping, hoping at the end that uh, of all of this that it will be easier for you to access information and easier for you to download information and also we're hoping we also have a new, some new services that we're offering people for free as well. So if I could just describe those services. One of the services is a USB memory stick service. What we're doing there is if, um, if anybody has a computer and they want to get any talk, all they have to do is email us with the talk. So they email through the office or they can email through DVD. Uh, it's probably a wrong name now, but uh, we're not sure what to call it. So they can email office or DVD at, div at divinetruth.com. And... They can list all of the material they'd like and we'll copy all of that material onto a USB stick and send it in the mail. Now, these USB sticks fit 16 gigabytes of information on them, um, which means they fit 10 videos around about or all of our audios and all of our documents. All right, so they can fit all of the audios, all of the documents, or 10 videos, or a combination of those things. So all they've got to do is let us know what ones they want, and we'll, we'll grab the USB stick, chuck it in an envelope, and send it to them. So that's a free service to anybody who wants that. We also have a USB hard disk drive service, which has been going now, but it's a lot, bit more organised now. USB hard drive service where anybody can send us a hard disk drive that's 500 gigabytes or larger and it has to be a USB drive or it can be an eSATA drive. No, do any of you know what a SATA drive is? So then maybe I shouldn't write that down. <laughs> but um, that book can be connected directly to your computer, internal to your computer. This one is connected external to your computer and we can copy either type of drive. As long as the drive is sent to us with a return addressed envelope or, and it needs to be packed well of course because these drives can fail, we can copy everything that we've got at the moment that's about 375 gigabytes of information onto that drive and send it back to you. Um, it takes anywhere from 5 to 15 hours for us to do that. So we actually have two computers uh, that, that run four copies at a time, uh, just processing copies. Right. And uh, every single thing that's on YouTube is on that drive. Every single thing that's on our website is on that drive. And, uh, and it, that's downloadable. So that means you have on one disk every single thing that we've ever produced. And you could, if you do a 500 gig drive or a bigger drive, you can download things of your own and add it to the drive if you wanted to from YouTube. Yep. Uh, microphone. Uh, like, uh, how long does it take for, say, this talk to get, if I send that hard drive to you, say, um, next week, uh, would that say include this talk, for example? No, the talks uh, that are latest, you must understand that all of the effort to produce these talks are all voluntary. Mm. And, and Lena and Igor in particular, but now Kate as well, is also looking at it being brought up to speed in how to, how to convert them. Conversion of one of these talks takes anywhere from 12 to 16 hours generally, right? Once you do a YouTube and the DVD cut of the talk. And that's assuming the sound is good and the video is good. 
if there's a problem, it can take longer. Now, if you look at what Mary and I produce in the course of a week, I have one interview or two interviews, and Mary has one book group, and then we may have one other thing like a mediumship. So that's four different materials being produced every single week if we don't do a seminar. If we do a seminar, then it's six every week. Now, that takes around about 80 hours of time to produce. Now, of course, you know, that's a lot of time. That's a lot of these guys' time. So, so you cannot expect to get a talk that we have here this week all of a sudden on the ne next week. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, the reason I ask is, is there, there was a talk in, um, on the 5th of May in Adelaide that I wanted to see again. Mm -hmm. um, That's already on YouTube. Oh, the, oh, I didn't find it. When did it go on? Oh, just put it on last night. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thanks. Also, <laughs> right. oh, um, if I say uh, send the hard drive, it, it, that, that'll include stuff from um, up till a month ago or something? or Not necessarily because oh, we do okay. also have a backlog. Remember talks have been given since 2007 yep. and we have a backlog of almost about 80 talks that we have not yet done. Oh, okay. So there's this backlog of talks plus every new talk that's and delivered. And so that's a lot of work. Yeah, that, that hard drive is just includes all the stuff that's on the YouTube and everything else. It doesn't include stuff that hasn't been processed yet. Uh, it includes things that are not yet on YouTube. Oh, okay, it does. But, okay. uh, but it hasn't, doesn't include everything. Yep. Okay, great. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. That, because there's certain things we've yet to produce. We've got the raw video for, but we have yet to actually do anything with the raw video because we have to prioritise the time we have, or particularly the time the guys have, to produce it. Yeah. It's a very big job, as you may understand, and, uh, and something that we need, like, uh, it needs a lot of time and it needs a lot of technical expertise, and, uh, but, but it, is, it can be easily, you know, taught to somebody, but it needs a decent computer and a lot of other things to actually do it as well. So it, it's quite a long-winded process, um, yeah, and there's not much we can do about reducing it except have more people doing it. Mm -hmm. Diana? So if I had one of those already mm -hmm. um, and then in six months' time I thought oh, I'd be great to get, you know, more on it, um, would I um, You have send two options. Yep. You could send the entire drive back to us and we would update it with all the new data. And, uh, but, but the way we do it, it blows away the data that's already on it. So... So we, it updates it with our latest copy. So if you've got any personal data on it, my suggestion is to get it off it before you send it. The alternative way is to get a 16 gigabyte memory stick from us, which has the talks that are missing. And then you load it. And then you, if you don't need the stick anymore, just send the stick back to us. Does that make sense? Because yeah. we can reuse them over and over again. These sticks cost us around about $20 each. And... Um, and, uh, you know, then, of course, there's postage, uh, which we do for free for people, and we rely on donations to be able to continue doing that. I've just bought a hundred of them, so we've got enough to just keep ticking away. But, but obviously, if, if you don't need them anymore, send them back to us, and then we can reuse them and send them on to somebody else. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. So we're, we're happy to sort of send things out to you and so forth. Um, and, but obviously, in these sessions, if... We, we want to, um, we'd prefer to give you things in a session than send them out via post because in the end post does chew up a lot of the donated funds. When we post overseas, for example, it can chew up quite significant funds. It's often close to the same price as the drive is. Now, to buy these hard disk drives, they're, the cheapest I've seen them online at the moment is about $90. Um, from Dick Smith's, there's a Dick Smith's store in Kingaroy. And uh, they had a special of them on about 90 bucks, I think they were, this month. Karen, and then down to Deb. Is it like the environment team where it's better to donate materials than money for these things? Yeah. Um, we're happy to receive either um, money or materials. Um, the beauty of materials is it's right there, then ready for us to use. We don't have to have somebody going out and buying it. But it needs to be the materials that we want. Not, it's, we don't want it to be everybody's rubbish because then we've got a problem 
getting rid of all the, all the rubbish. So we want it to be material that we can utilise or use and this is why you need to check with the different team leaders as to what particular material we need. So if it's terms of uh, construction material, then refer to Gary. If it's environmental type material like mulch type stuff, hay or all those kind of things or stuff to put in the holes, talk to Rob and Ange, they're leading the team, the environment team at the moment. So it just depends on which team as to, as to what, who you would talk to. They know the specific things that are needed. I, I don't know those specific things that are needed. Yep. So it's Lena and Igor for that kind of thing? For Lena and Igor, yes. Um, Lena and Igor work quite uh, a lot with me, so I do know what we need. Uh, for example, right at the moment, Lena, uh, Igor has run out of space with, with one of our big drives to do copying with. And uh, really, ideally, it'd be nice to have another one of those drives, which is, but it's $2,200 for a new one of those drives. So we, we do know what we need to continue working and doing things and to do things faster. But uh, so with anything technical, you could come to me and I can certainly uh, sort it out. If I'm not around, then speak to Igor about the issues, techni the technical stuff. Yep. Thank you. Yep. And Deb, down the front here, and then up back. I was just wondering if we could drop off our hard drives yes. and collect them. Yes. And where would that be? Uh, you can drop them off to myself or to Luli. Um, uh, you're doing some copying as well. So okay. um, it's if I'm not around, Luli's probably the way to go. Drop them mm -hmm. off to Luli. What's your address, Luli? Do you mind? Can You don't want this on the net, though, do you, your address? So yeah. can we just turn off the cameras? Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Well, I, I think you can all smell the food now. That's, so I think it's time probably for us to finish today. Myself and Mary would like to thank all of you for your donations and those of you that have helped uh, us uh, with our trip going, coming overseas. We'd like to thank you for that. Uh, we're still not certain about some of the organisation of it because the visa issues with uh, Brazil are quite strange. So we're having to sort out some of those issues. But um, we're looking forward to being able to spend some time with our our uh, actual brothers and sisters all over the world in different places and particularly in new places where you know there are a lot there's a lot more poverty and um, so that's uh, we find is an interesting process on this trip so we're looking forward to that myself and Mary are looking forward to that and um, I'd like to thank all of those people who have been heavily involved in helping us uh, getting a lot of this divine truth out um, and so, and maybe you'd like to also thank them too, not only by your putting your hands together, but also think about what you can do for them to help them do that, you know, because, because they, do, they do spend a lot, a lot of their resources and uh, a lot of time doing it. And uh, what we're going to be doing on, uh, on the net is we've now created pages for donations to each peop person that's helping us uh, almost full time. So anybody that's helping us almost full time, we're actually putting a page on our website so that you can donate to them straight, straight to them uh, rather than donating via us or anything like that. And that also helps them realise how much they're appreciated as well um, for the work they do. Okay, well thank you very much for your time today. That's the end of our session today. There won't be no second session today. And... Um, is there anything you would like to add, Mary? Like, oh, you're pretty right, right? You guys don't need to add anything more, no. And so, our next time we'll see you here will probably be Saturday, June the. Ah, uh, it might be in one die. Um, it probably will be in one die, but July the. No, it's not. It's June thirty. And that'll be a book group and a possible talk by myself or an interview um, process on June, June the 30. That's the next one that's local um, to, to all of us. In between now and then, we're doing a lot of things travelling around. People have to travel to see us. People have to travel to see us, yeah. <laughs> we think of selling our house. That felt like a level end, didn't it? That was a joke.
<laughs> but, but I'm sure it brought up a bit of fear for those of you who moved here. <laughs> uh, and we'd like to uh, hope that you enjoy the next few weeks without, without our company. I'm sure you will. And, uh, and we look forward to catching up with you in a month's time. For those of you who are interested in the other locations of where we're going, um, I think there is a download under the schedule now on the old, the current website that's on the net. You'll find it there. And so you'll be able to download uh, the schedule from the website. And it has all of the details about where we are on each day up until we get home. But not after, isn't it? Oh, okay. Thanks, guys. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs>